I'm ready to ride. Spamming one more quest. How long have you been setting this up? Since yesterday? <laughs> I'm like, nah, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> oh god, he's having so much trouble even loading you all in. <laughs> you maniacs. You should start from the beginning, that's for sure. It's to really drink this in. And what a welcome it was to Heavensward. There are some things my streamer privilege I will never be sorry for, and one of them is welcomes like that to a new expansion. I know it's been a while, and I haven't done an update on the end of A Realm Reborn. I have finished it. I've done absolutely everything I want to do, including all the coils. I've got to do a full review of A Realm Reborn, because I think it deserves it, honestly, because there's a lot there to unpack in little updates. But I do want to talk about Heaven's War today, because I was super interested in what Squeenix was going to do. They had this rebuilding. They had this relaunch, and it went super well. What's the next step? What did they learn that they still didn't get quite right? How are people receiving their classes? How was that working out for them? What are they going to do with their dungeons and their raids? Because I can clearly see in Coils, they started to change their minds about the approach they were taking. So what information were they going to take from that and then move into Heaven's Ward? What was their next big step going to be? So I played about half of it. Let's go in. I want to start out by talking about the zones a little bit because I wasn't aware of what zones we were going to get beyond Ishgard. Obviously, after a Realm Reborn, you get taken straight to Ishgard, but you basically get inside and then that's the end of a Realm Reborn and then it gets started. So that, that's where I want to kick off from. Firstly, uh, Ishgard was so oppressive. Like it, They really did a good job in making you feel like there's something wrong here. And the actual design of the city itself is a great way of doing that. The, the, the giant looming towers, while you can clearly see the people down below, gives you that in entire indication that this is a very oppressive place. This is not probably the kind of place you'd want to grow up in, especially if you were poor. You don't want to be there. You're not part of the big crew lives up on high. And it was very, very interesting how quickly it was very... Uh, very equitable to Dark Souls, actually, especially Dark Souls 3. And it was it was one of those places where you're like, hmm, yeah, you got a crane your neck to see what's up there, dude. See what's going on. It's a downtrodden place, despite its pretty veneer. And it is pretty. It's pretty, but it's also very, very oppressive. And that came across really well when you went outdoors into the snowy ruins. I really enjoyed that they bring up that this used to be a lush green landscape and you find camps that happened before the calamity and now it is this wasteland one of the things i love the most is their weather effects in the game are fantastic so you could see the beacons uh the lit the lit torches of the various campites like through the fog and the mist and the snowy blizzard you could see them in the distance and it really gave you this impression that you're in a very inhospitable place to be i i truly enjoyed it i have a very and this is going to come apparent throughout this i have a punch a punch for the the macabre and the dark and all that kind of stuff. I, I like that kind of storytelling and this has has that in spades. I'm going to get to the story in a bit. But initially the first zones were fantastic. Falcon's Nest, moving around there, going into these wastelands, finding all these downtrodden and destroyed buildings from the Calamity. All that kind of stuff. In contrast though, the more aerial aerial areas that were kind of like in the grand style, style area from World of Warcraft, uh, I didn't like as much. Uh, they, they, they walked a fine line here between... Having something cool up in the clouds and it just being frustrating to navigate. Um, the uh, tenants who live there, was like, eh, okay. And then the Moogles came back and it was like, eh, you know, compared to the first zone, I don't like these as much. There's a queef. And another. Oh, 
Don't like this. Don't like this at all. Mario's here. <laughs> I've only done like three of the zones out of the six, I believe, that are in Heaven's Ward. Uh, so I found them a little bit less. They were definitely saved by Bismarck. Uh, the first primal that you see in Heaven's Ward. That kind of rescued those zones for me. But in comparison to the first zone, that was they, they weren't as good for me. To, uh, because they were a bit too light and lively. And Moogles make everything fluffy and cute. Uh, and all that kind of stuff. So that was good. But when Bismarck showed up, I was like, oh, okay, this is... Yeah, I can dig this. I, I get the idea that we're using the clouds as an ocean. That's a really cool idea. We got to see Sid back and all that kind of stuff. Uh, speaking of those then, I guess we should talk about the voice acting. Because all the way through Realm Reborn, people were shitting on the voice acting. Uh, and that in Heaven's Ward, it's so much better. One book. For the future of Eorzea! Yikes. Uh, sometimes, sometimes not. Now, the quality or impression of a voice actor is always going to be subjective. Uh, some people are going to love the voice acting, some people are not. I mean, they changed everybody, pretty much, from what I could tell. Sometimes, in my opinion, it worked. Sometimes, it did not. That is what I would say there. So, for instance, what really worked was Alphano. Now, I want to be clear here. I don't dislike A Realm Reborn's Alphano's voice actor at all. In any way, I thought... That character played out really well as a young kid trying to fill some very big shoes and just not having that level of maturity to handle what's going on. And clearly, there are, you know, I mean, as strong as Alphano is, they're still a physically frail child. That's what they are. And Alice is the same. Uh, I still haven't seen Alice in Heaven's Ward. I don't know what Alice is up to, but I'll find out, I'm sure. Uh, but Al I Alphano came across exactly as I would expect a very right and proper um, character should be. I really enjoyed Alphano's character. However, I would say Heaven's Ward has improved that because Heaven's Ward's Alphano has a level of increased maturity. Now, after what happened in A Realm Reborn and with the Coils, it's unquestionable that Alphano should be not only aging physically but also mentally is dealing with the fall of the Crystal Braves, where he had the opportunity to lead a crew and it all collapsed, uh, and he doubting himself, but also having to deal with very rigorous things. And I thought the voice acting came across really well with demonstrating that. Opposed, though, and this is probably because I'm English, the overwhelming switch of pretty much every character to be super English was really jarring. Like, especially because they decided to go with what are generally considered to be very rural accents in the UK. Now, I'm from the UK. I've lived here all my life. I do not sound like anybody in Heaven's Ward at all. I don't sound like a single character, yet they're all overwhelmingly English. So, a couple of ones that I really didn't like. One was Raban, who's now just Sean Bean. Uh, didn't seem to fit his character at all. Not that his Realm Reborn character was particularly good. I don't want to say that either. But this switch didn't make it better in any way for me. It just feels really out of place. Uh, similarly with the Admiral, actually. I loved the Admiral's voice. I considered the Admiral to be one of the best voice acted characters in A Realm Reborn. I think it really fit this salty, um, seaworthy ex-pirate who had risen, to, you know, with some years, some seasoning behind her, who had become the Admiral. I really felt that fit. By contrast, in A Realm Reborn, in Heaven's Ward, the voice actress for the Admiral uh, is very, very similar to the lady who runs my local cafe. And I cannot not hear that. <laughs> I can't not hear that. The voice acting is fine. It's well acted. But I just... It, that's what it is to me. And when I hear it, I'm like, oh, uh, I feel like she's going to ask me for some egg and beans in a minute. Um, for that kind of stuff. So it's a mixed bag, is what I would say for me. It's a mixed bag. Uh, Sid is also very strange. I preferred Sid's. A Realm Reborn voice actor compared to this. Again, I think it's jarring to me because it's so overwhelmingly English. Uh, we've even got Devon uh, accents in there, which are very strange for me to see. And then I'm seeing people say, oh, that accent is so sexy. I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay, sure. Whatever tickles you both. So I, I'd say overwhelming, uh, overwhelming mixed. 
Some I like, some I don't, but I think that's always going to be the case with voice actor changes and things like that. And I have no doubt the typical thing is after you've been listening to them for, you know, a few hours, like that just becomes their voice and you kind of forget what they had in A Realm Reborn. Uh, and that's started to happen. Like, I still see Reborn as Sean Bean. Uh, he's not dead yet, but, you know, that's going to come uh, for sure. Let's talk about the story a little bit. I want to talk about the story, and I want to do this kind of face-to-face, -face because there's a lot here to unpack, honestly. Let's start at the beginning. The l first, like, few hours of Heaven's Ward are all about world-building and setting up a story. That surprised me a great deal, because the end of A Realm Reborn was entirely dedicated to setting stuff up. We had the Scions being killed, which... <laughs> I still don't believe, man. I've got this Infinity War mindset, which is like, yeah, you kind of killed off all the Scions of the Seventh Dawn, besides a couple, but then they're not really dead. However, I can, I can tell you this. I'm like halfway through Heaven's Ward, and they've not been mentioned at all. They're playing it as if they're totally dead, and they might be. I don't know, but I still don't believe it. Yet they're just not mentioned at all, and we've got very deep into the story. But the beginning bit wasn't boring. I don't want it to come across that it was boring, it was just a lot of world building and set up so they can have the proper payoff. Learning about Ishgard was interesting, like really interesting, of what they've been through because they had these luscious green lands that got changed in the Calamity. It's an oppressive place, it's a dark place that's been sealed off. They have a lot of internal problems which you can tell just by the imagery of Ishgard definitely exist. And as more of that unfolds and you hear about the very drawn on real life comparisons of a lot of these high houses, the archbishop, all having these dirty dealings that were hidden behind this luster of piety. Um, it's, it's very clear that there's an unsettling undercurrent of what's going on. And then that brings us, of course, to the Dragon Song War. Now, the Dragon Song War, and again, the reason I wanted to like talk to you about it like this is morally grey done right. And I know when I say that, people just think, oh, you're just shitting on World of Warcraft. I'm not, really. But morally grey done right doesn't need to be told... You don't need to be told it's morally grey. You start figuring that out as the reality of the situation unfolds. And that's what I felt playing through this story. To give you context, I'm up to the twist with Harshafon, which was really sad, uh, yet amazing at the same time. And it's... Leading up to that, I was like, everybody sucks here. And this is how it's done right, and it's what really immersed me. So we did have this kind of slow build-up of the story in order to put all the chess pieces on the board, but once they got going into, like, let's let's move these out, let's move Lady Iceheart into position, let's move her Elsvagar into position, let's do all these things, then it really started to play out. I loved, in fact, Estenian, uh, how he is so one-track-minded, He's so brutal. He knows his mission. And there's a period in the story where he starts to... You can tell there was like a flicker of hope that perhaps he was changing. Because we have this conflict between Lady, Heis Lady Iceheart and Estenian. I'm shipping those two, by the way. They fucking... Oh, they fucking at some point. I'm sure of it. But she's trying to push one way for the, you know, the solidarity of Dragonkind that it's all the people's fault and true, that, you know, that started the war and all this kind of stuff. And you can see Estenian is like, no, the dragons need to be wiped out. They're such a permanent threat to Ishgard. There's no hope of peace. There is no way we're going to resolve this. And then Estenian realizes that Ishgard is built on a fucking lie. And this is their mightiest warrior. This is the Azure Dragoon. This is the guy who is there for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to murder every single dragon that exists on this planet in order to protect Ishgard. And yet he isn't this one-dimensional character at all. And actually, surprisingly to me, because so often in video games, we're presented with these characters that are completely ridiculously stupid, where Estenian looks around and he says, you guys are right. Ishgard is built on a lie. There's no way, and I think he sits below one of the temples, and he says, there's no way I can look at what I'm seeing and not agree that at one point in time, humans and dragons lived in peace and everything i've been taught since i was born since the day i came into this world is bullshit and then to have that entirely shattered around him when it's like and it doesn't matter because the threat 
that I am bred to defend us against still exists. It's still there. But there was that glimmer, and that's the kind of moments that good storytelling is all about. There's a lot more that goes on with Lady Iceheart's world being crashed around her. The re revelation of the actions of so few leading to a potential eternity of torment for an entire world. I really enjoyed how they really focused on should the sons pay for the sins of the fathers? And how does that widespread? Should an entire culture and an entire world be punished for eternity for the actions of so few earlier on? And then we see that the Knights of the Twelve weren't united in their opinions. They weren't united on their fronts. And the original Zero Dragoon was completely overwhelmed with the guilt of knowing, similar to what Stenian has to go through, of, I have to clean this mess up. And I didn't start it, I didn't make it, but I have to deal with that now for the rest of my life. And several people who would have been major contributors to the High Houses of Ishgard, walking away, saying, I want no part of this. I was following this, this is not what I'm here for, and I'm out. And then the sad truth that the remaining high houses, as corrupt as they may have become in some form later on, realizing that they need to stand in solidarity in order for Ishgard to survive. Because now there's this never-ending punishment coming their way to protect their people. I loved it. I, can't, I, I think you can tell, right? <laughs> I think you can tell from me talking about it is I absolutely adored this because... It, set, it took its time to set everything up. It didn't try and do... And I often like to compare it to the Marvel movies because I think most people have seen it, so there's some connection there. Is that you have Marvel versus DC, which has been a big war that's been going on in movie franchises for like a decade now, is that the Marvel movies did better because they just took their time. They took their time, they slowly introduced things, they let them breathe, they let some character development flow. Whereas you have the DC guys who are like, there's money to be made, and they, they ran in and were like... Oh, we're going to do everything in like five minutes and at the end of it you're like i don't feel anything i don't care i really just know i'm not interested whereas on this side it was the opposite they took their time i, I mean when i first met Estenian, who i've just you know talked about so, so excessively i was like this guy's so ridiculous he's so edgelord he's like a, like a, a teenage fantasy of what they want to be they're introducing this class and he's hopping around he's got a big spear he's got cool armor and all that kind of stuff. And then through this story and the time it's undeveloped, I was like, I really feel for this guy because he still has his mission to fulfill, but I'm no doubt this guy has doubts, but he still is the protector. That's his job and that's where he's wanted to go. So ultimately, even though the Aoyasians are involved and things like that, like, again, I'm halfway through the story and it could all collapse. I, I don't think it will, but I think this could all collapse around me, but I would say for, certainly for an MMO, and in fact, most RPGs, this is one of the best storytelling moments that I've ever seen. Because there are so many layers to it, and there's tragedy and death and happiness and joy that are all spread throughout this, and plans being foiled, especially the plans to, uh, the, <laughs> I know I'm spoiling a bit here, but it's just these moments that are so integral to why I enjoyed this so much. Such so as the Archbishop's plan is to let the people kill each other. We need nightmares in the streets and the people being like, there's no need for us. We will call a truce here. We will have it. And it very much reminded me of End of Game of Thrones, uh, the attack on King's Landing at the end, where they stupidly then went on to murder everybody because the Queen said so. Uh, and the, the soldiers went on to fight. It was only Jon Snow who was like, wait a minute, what are we doing? Like, the, the truce has been called. There's no need for more needless death. And the, the opposite of what most people consider to be terrible storytelling in Game of Thrones was that in Heaven's War, they were like, the people put down their weapons. They were like, no, okay. That's what we were here to fight for, and that has been resolved. And I, I love that all so very much. Let us move on to the dungeons then, because this was something I was super interested in, is to what they felt they did right with the dungeons, and how they were going to improve them, how they're going to show new tech, those kinds of things that come with a typical expansion. Because uh, certainly when you move through, say, WoW expansions, uh, the dungeons change dramatically in, in terms of how they're played out. Like, so if going from vanilla to the Burning Crusade, which is kind of what we've done here, uh, the dungeons got much longer, they got much more difficult, they got um, extra modes and things like that. Now, to rem if you didn't see, I love the Realm Reborn dungeons, and I particularly love that at the end, they just gave you all the dungeons again. I'm hoping to see something similar happens with Heavensward. 
uh, is that they give you the like, part twos to these dungeons. My absolute favorite dungeon, let's talk about that one, because I think that's the best example, is was actually the first one I did, which was the Dusk Vigil. This I love. Not only was it mixed with that really oppressive uh, atmosphere that the zone sets, but one thing I love is that in FF, they give you context and story for the dungeon you're going into. Uh, I really enjoy that because it just adds more to it than it just being, oh, you can queue for a dungeon. Uh, by telling you very clearly why you're going here and what's happening inside, it gives you that extra feeling of what to expect or perhaps that you're doing the wrong thing, uh, which is something that was very prevalent in a Realm Reborn Dungeons is that you're going in there to slaughter these uh, golems that have been trapped beneath the earth because of us for hundreds of years and they're really pissed off. Damn right they're really pissed off. You trapped them for hundreds of years. But well, that doesn't change the fact we need the resources, so you need to go in and kill them. So these guys finally got freedom after a couple of hundred years, and now you're going to go down and kill them anyway. Uh, which is, you know, it has that questionable morality that we've talked about already. Uh, in this one, though, one thing, the extra ones I do love are the notes inside, which kind of set the scene for what's uh, what's been happening outside of what we know from the from the actual outside looking in we know that the like for example that the golems escaped but in the dusk vigil you're dealing with a bunch of soldiers that were trapped during the calamity we know that that's what happened in there but once you're inside you actually find the diaries and the ledgers of what the soldiers went through because they were trapped inside the vigil they just couldn't get out and it was snowed in so this once luscious green paradise is now become this completely frozen wasteland which they're woefully unprepared for because that's not the environment they're in there's no food so they ended up turning to cannibalism and the darkness and and horrors that those guys suffered inside because they simply couldn't get out and they were trapped inside with somebody who turned into an ultimate madman and the the craziness and the stir the stir craziness that went on because they were stuck inside there was no communication with the outside world and they just simply were trapped there as all resources and things ran out and I, this was the story that dragged me into that dungeon and made it my absolute favorite my second favorite would of course be the Harshafon dungeon going into the vault like I, you know for the sake of not doing too many spoilers here that one was fantastic the others were fine I haven't particularly done a bad dungeon yet. Uh, it's always interesting to see. I do get an instant response, obviously, from my live stream uh, of people's favorites and stuff. And they, I, they worship with this one. One thing I did notice after I brought up the Dusk Vigil there is a lot of people who just never read the notes because they were going in, they were getting either XP or they were rushing to level or they're just doing the dungeon. Uh, and then were like, I'm going to come back here and do this dungeon because I didn't realize half of this stuff is in here. And it is. And when you read it, you're like, oh my god, this is actually really cool because you're doing a cool dungeon and the dungeon is cool uh, while also getting this extra flashed out background in there as well. Uh, I do want to talk about the primals. Um, the primals were my absolute favorite um, part of A Realm Reborn. Like, I loved coils. That was fun. But the primals themselves were so varied and so interesting that I really enjoyed that. I loved how they paced them out throughout the, the, throughout the game. So my first primal that I see is Bismarck, which is a giant cloud whale, which was really cool. And I was like, oh god, this is going to be like Leviathan. How are we going to fight this? Are we going to have to fight in the clouds? And I still have not fought Bismarck, but that's not the first primal you fight. You see Bismarck the first time, but it's not the first primal you fight. In fact, the first primal you fight is Ravana. And they walk such a fine line here between the ridiculous uh, and the Power Rangers for it being cool. And they nailed the cool side of it. They really nailed it because having something that could be a Power Rangers enemy, which if it looked a little goofier, would have really taken me out of it. It would have been like too, uh, like over the top anime style, uh, but they didn't do that. Even with a battle with Shiva uh, that they actually played off super well. I was actually very, very surprised at how well Ravana came off. Uh, what I also enjoyed is the fight itself because I'm obviously looking towards the extremes. I'm looking towards the extremes to see what this fight is going to be like when we actually do it in its harder version, uh, rather than its more like story-based, easier version. And this is close to quarters. I am, I am dying to do this fight on extreme. Seeing it in its really encapsulated close quarters area, uh, the, the type of abilities this boss does, it's this claustrophobic environment of it. They played it off super well. Not only was the intro really, really good, and I was waiting for it to go a little bit too far, but they didn't. They restrained it, they held it back, and they just made it cool. Then the fight itself has so much promise that I, I'm very happy with what they're pulling off here. I'm super, super... Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling from ear to ear, for sure.
That's what I have to tell you about Heaven's Ward so far. There's more of what I get into, such as the development of the Black Mage has been radical in my eyes. But I'm going to do that in a different video, uh, along with our Realm Reborn review. Thank you so much for watching, guys. If you want any information or you want to support the channel in some way, head over to our website, preachgaming.com, right? Looking forward to speaking to you again. We've got Lost Ark on the go now. I'm playing as, through it as much as I possibly can. So I'll have some more information on Lost Ark for you in the next day or so. All right, so be good, and I'll see you again. Bye-bye.